In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. We go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to walk through the book of 1 Samuel. We're not going to read everything, but we're going to hit everything that's important uh, as we go through it. And so we'll try to dedicate a video to one or two chapters and just kind of go real slow so you can understand everything in each chapter. And you can just go to playlist and you can find the playlist on 1 Samuel and the playlist on other biblical books as well. And so let's go now to chapter one. If you go right to uh, ver the first verses, it's kind of a little difficult. It says, there was a certain man from Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim. So this is, in, this is in the hill country of Ephraim, which was in the north of Israel, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jer Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Wow, there's a lot right there. That first verse is enough to scare you from reading this book, but it gets much easier after that. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other uh, was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And so it really, it's the story of a woman who's barren, and she's praying to God for the gift of a child. And so it tells us that they went to the sanctuary that was in Shiloh and that uh, Penina would really give it to Hannah because she was barren. And especially as they were going to the sanctuary, she would bug Hannah. And so the priest uh, it, uh, was sitting at the door of the sanctuary. His name was Eli, Eli and he heard Hannah praying and it sounded like she was kind of drunk. Now, where was the sanctuary at? The sanctuary was in in the north. Well, not really in the north. It's more the center of Israel, but in a place called Shiloh. It was north of Jerusalem. And this area is where, the, where eventually the northern kingdom of Israel would be. So that's why I say north. But the ark it was over in Shiloh for somewhere between 360 years or 390 years. Scholars debate how long it was there. But the bottom line is that during annual feast days and days of pilgrimage, people would go to Shiloh to pray. So for instance, males over a certain age of military age, they were required to go during three feast days. Passover, which also was followed by unleavened bread, Pentecost and Tabernacles. Pentecost is known as the Feast of Weeks as well, and Tabernacles is often referred to as the Feast of Booths or Sukkoth, okay? How do you like that? And so for those three feast days, males were required to go, but they would go for other celebrations as well. So this was an important religious center of Israel at the time. And so you can imagine Hannah going to the sanctuary, Penina bugging her and giving her a hard time and just, you know, because she doesn't have any children. So you have to go back to Genesis and remember God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And then after the flood, he gave the same command, be fruitful and multiply. And so when God promised to bless Abraham, fertility, especially children, was was among the blessings, the blessing of children. This is a blessing from God. And so to not have children could sometimes be associated with being cursed or something just simply being insufficient in your life. And so here's Hannah's rival, Penina, giving her a hard time as they go on their pilgrimage, as they go to the sanctuary. And you can just imagine how bitter she made Hannah's life. So let's see what it says in the text. If we go to 1 Samuel and read a little bit, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Now this man, um, the his, his name was Elkanah, okay? So we go, this man used to go up year by year from his city to, to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, the tabernacle. And where the two sons of Eli were, Hophni and Phineas. So Eli was the high priest. Hophni and Phineas were his sons. They would become the future high priest. However, they were so bad that you're going to find out what happens. They're actually going to die before they become the future high priest. And so Hophni and Phineas were priests of the Lord. 
Uh, some scholars say that Eli was very old, and so Hophni and Phineas, his sons, were doing most of the work for him. So in verse 4, it says, On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. And although he loved Hannah, he would give Hannah only one portion because the Lord had closed her womb. Now, what does this story remind you of? If you go back and you look at the story of the patriarchs, you might remember the marriage of Jacob, uh, where Jacob married Leah, and Leah had children, but Rachel did not have any children. And so, and so, you know, you kind of see a situation, you know, that's that's similar. And and Jacob really loved Rachel, but she just didn't have any children. OK, and so uh, there's a situation that's kind of similar to that. And this is in verse six. It says, and her rival used to provoke her sorely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year as often as she went up to the house of the Lord and she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? How do you like that? Beautiful words of consolation. And in verse 9, it says, And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose, and now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat besides the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. It's very interesting that the tabernacle is called the temple of the Lord. Scholars argue over what this means. A lot of scholars think that maybe because it was there so long in Shiloh for over 300 years that there was some type of basically stable structure that was built um, and to house the tabernacle. So that's one theory. We don't know exactly. Uh, verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, now look at her vow, verse 11, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me. Notice the concept of remembering. This is exactly what God did in Genesis uh, 18 and in Genesis uh, 20 when Sarah gave birth to Isaac. So remember me and not forget thy maidservant, but wilt give to thy maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord and all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued to pray before the Lord and Eli, the priest is looking at her and she's moving her mouth, but there's no words coming out. So you can imagine what Eli thought, you know, so it says in verse uh, 13, it says, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Eli said, what's wrong with this woman? She's not, she's over here praying, moving her lips, but no words are coming out. And so in verse 14, it says, And Eli said to her, How long will you be drunken? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman sorely troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your maidservant as a base woman, for all along I have been speaking out my great anxiety and vexation. And Eli answered her, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have made to him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her countenance was no longer sad. So what's really interesting about this uh, first section here is she's praying, she, and Eli thinks she's drunk. And if you remember Acts chapter 1 and 2, if you remember Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, they actually thought that the church, when it received the Holy Spirit, the promising gift of the Holy Spirit, they thought the apostles and the other disciples of Jesus were drunk as well. So we see a, a common theme here. We see a lot of themes in 1 Samuel that we find in the New Testament. It's really interesting that Eli's at the door of the temple and he sees Hannah. Uh, and so he's kind of like observing her as she's praying. Uh, and her soul is bitter. And this reminds you of a few situations in the Old Testament. First and foremost, it reminds us of the bitter sufferings that the Israelites experienced. You can find that in Exodus chapter 1, right around verse 14. And then Noemi, if you remember no, the story of Ruth and so forth, Noemi, when her two son-in-laws died and she didn't have any children, she actually asked the people of Bethlehem to call her Mara, which means bitter. So, you know, we see a similar 
theme here in the story of Noemi, um, which will be a couple generations later, very interestingly. Um, and of course, in both cases, the bitterness was transformed through the birth of a new child. So if you look closely at Hannah's vow, look at her prayer. She made this vow to God. It's a promise to the Lord. And she's asking God, look upon me and remember me. The word remember in Hebrew, it has a lot broader sense than it has in English. And very, um, you could say specifically, it underlines God acting on his promise, okay? It's more than just cognitively thinking about uh, Hannah, but she's asking the Lord to remember him, to act upon his promise to bless the people of Israel. Do not forget your servant. And notice how she she presents herself to the Lord as a servant. This We can learn a lot from this. We want to present ourselves to God as servants. This is the attitude that we should have. A little later on, when you get to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 17 and forward, David does exactly the same thing. He could have looked back to this example of Hannah. And she goes on and she says, but we'll give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite. So notice that she's gonna set him before the Lord as a Nazarite until the day of his death. Now, if you go back to the book of Numbers, right around, I think it's chapter five or six, I think it's chapter end of chapter five, beginning of chapter six, you find the Nazarite vow. OK, and so right here you see a few elements of it. He shall neither drink wine nor intoxicants. No razor shall touch his head. So she's promising that this child will be completely dedicated to the Lord as a Nazarite. And so Samuel's dedicated to the service of the sanctuary in Shiloh from the time that he's a small child. Of course, he has to be weaned. And when he's old enough to finally you know, go help out, he's completely dedicated to the service of the sanctuary. It's very amazing to consider that. The high priest at the time, his name was Eli, Eli or Eli, and he unfortunately was not a good father. He did not take very good care of his children. His children were running out of control, and he basically was not able to discipline them correctly. And so it's going to end up causing lots of problems as we go on in the story of 1 Samuel. So Hannah's prayer is answered and she's given a child. And so the, the whole concept of a barren woman who's given a child, we see it in the New Testament. If you look at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth as well, uh, we see this story also in the book of Judges. If you go to Judges and you, and you look at the story of Samson's birth, you find that his father Manoah and his, his wife, who's not named, she was barren as well. And so this story kind of repeats itself a few times in scripture. And what's really interesting is when you look at the text, it says that God actually closed Hannah's womb. And this is one that really makes us think because Here's this woman who's extremely faithful. She's loved by her husband, and yet God has closed her womb. And it's it's like the Lord is purifying her faith. He's testing her faith. And she remains faithful to the Lord, even in the midst of her great distress. And so the child is weaned, and he's he goes and he works in the sanctuary. So we're just going to read the very end of chapter 1. And we're going to see how this works out right here. So it says, if you go to uh, verse 22, it says, Hannah did not go up for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and abide there ever, forever. Amazing. Completely given to the Lord. It, it technically says lent to the Lord. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do whatever seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained, nursed her son until she weaned him, until he was a certain age. Now, a weaned child in the ancient world could any, be anywhere between two years old and seven years old. So it doesn't say how old the child is here. But it sounds like he's old enough. He's a little boy and he can talk and so forth. So we're guessing somewhere between five and seven years old here, if you look at the story of the first Samuel. And so verse 24, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah flower, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slew the bull and they brought the child to Eli. 
And she said, oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He has lent to the Lord, and they worship the Lord there. So they offered the sacrifice, and they worship God there. Now, the last thing I want to say is, the, this is a great testimony of faith to Eli. He was the high priest, but unfortunately, he was not very good at disciplining his sons. And he let his sons basically run wild. Uh, and here's this faithful woman saying, look at how God answered my prayer. Look at how God is when God is faithful. It's a shame that Eli didn't learn something from this situation. And we finish 1 Samuel there. We'll continue with 1 Samuel chapter 2 in just a moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.